So something slightly different with today's computer file. Um, rather than recording this in our usual location, this one was actually recorded in front of a live studio audience uh, as part of a training exercise um, for other members of staff uh, in computer science at Nottingham. So we hope you enjoy it. It's got a slightly different feel to it, but if you hear people laughing in the background, um, they're laughing at me, not the topic. So I thought today we'd continue on the discussion we've had about compression. Um, we did the video, I did an overview, and we talked there about how we can define compression in terms of a model, how we actually model the data, and in terms of an encoding, how we represent that data in terms of bits. And we can change the encoding, we could use something like Huffman encoding to compress it, or we talked about how we can change the model to get better compression as well. And I want to talk about that today. I'm going to look at my favorite compression algorithm, which is BZIP2. I mean, how sad is that to have a favorite compression algorithm? But I'm a computer scientist, so. BZIP2 algorithm is based around what's called the Burroughs-Wheeler transform. And this was developed by a chap called Mike Burroughs based on some work that his PhD supervisor had done, David Wheeler, in Cambridge. He was over in digital at the time, and he went on to develop a search engine called AltaVista. For anyone who's over the age of 25, you might remember that as what we used to search the internet before this young upstart called Google came along. So we're going to have a look at the Burroughs-Wheeler transform because it's not necessarily the thing that you would think that would actually help with compression. But when you actually use it, and particularly with a couple of other things, it actually gets a really nice bit of compression going. Let's look at a common English phrase. I'm going to go with to be or not to be. This string, if you were to use a compression algorithm like run length encoding, wouldn't actually compress that well. We talked about run length encoding in the previous video. It's where you have your symbols, and rather than just saying there's this symbol, you say how long that would occur for. So in this case, there's one T, there's one O, there's one space, there's one B, there's one E, and as we talked about, the string has got massively bigger. It's expanded rather than compressing it. It doesn't compress that well. But things get interesting if you actually sort the string. So if we were to sort this, not into alphabetical order, but based on its ASCII ordering, so using the numbers that represent the characters, what we'd end up with, we've got one, two, three, four, five spaces. I'll draw them as underscores just to make it clear. And then we'd have the letters in order. We've got no A's, we've got a B. So there's one, we've got another B there, there's two. We've got some E's, we've got one E there, we've got one E there, so we've got two E's. Um, what comes next in the alphabet? Uh, N, we've got an N. We've got one, two, three, four O's, and we've got two T's, I think three T's. When we get it to that point, when we've sorted it, we get it to a form that is actually more compressible by using something like run length encoding. We've now got five spaces, two Bs, two Es, one N, four Os, and three Ts. And we can compress that relatively nicely using run length encoding. Does it matter you missed out an R? Uh, and there's an R in there as well. <laughs> this would compress really, really well, as we said, but there's a problem with it. If we've got this string, there's no way we can get it back to to be or not to be. Because we've changed the ordering, we no longer have that information. So we've got a model that captures the ordering of the text, which is what we're interested in, really, because we want to be able to read Hamlet, possibly. Um, or we've got an encoding, which, or a model, rather, which throws away all that information, but gives us the letters. Is there something that we can do in between that gets us to a point which is really compressible, but actually still gets us to a point where we can keep the information that we want, the text string, the ordering. And this is where the Burroughs-Wheeler transform comes in. So let's pick a slightly simpler example to start with, because I really don't want to have to write out to be or not to be too many times. So we're going to use this word as an example to see how the Burroughs-Wheeler transform works. What you do is you start off writing down the data you want to encode. I'm using text here, but you could use any data for this. And you just, on the first line, write it out as it is. And then on the next line, you rotate it to the left by one. So we start off with O, M, P, whoops, that's a P, obviously, T, U, T, E, R, P, H, I, L, E. And then we put that C that's fallen off the left-hand side on the end. And we keep doing that until we get back to where we started from. Now, I could do this by hand, and we'd be here until Christmas. So I have written a computer program to do it for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the word computer file. I'm going to send it into the program that I have written. And I'm going to get it to generate the complete Burroughs-Wheeler transform for us. And what we end up with is this matrix, this table, where we have all the letters rotated around until we've done it 13 times. And we end up with the last one where we've got the E at the beginning 
and the rest of the word follows that. Now, why is that useful? You might be thinking, well, how's that gonna help us compress? What we do is we take that table and we sort it based on ASCII ordering. And if we do that, if we sort it, we end up with the list below. Um, and on the left-hand side, in the left-hand column, because we've sorted it, we end up with the words and the characters that we saw before. The sorted form, as we got when we did it to be or not to be, we get exactly the same here. C-E-E-H-I-L-M-O-P-P-R-T-U. Again, we've lost all the information there, we're not interested in that. What we're interested in is what's in the last column. Because once we've sorted it, if we take that last column, we can regenerate the complete data that we started with. How does that work? Well, let's switch back to the example. If we sort it and we take that last column, E-L-T-P-H-I-O-C-R-M-E-U-P, -E and sort that again, what we end up with is C-E-E-H, et cetera, that we had before. So if we take the last column, as we said, we can regenerate the first column because we can sort it. So we can get the C-E-E-H. Now, if we pair them together, and I'm going to write this on the paper now, we get E, which is the character in the last column that we started with, first character, and C, which is the character from the first column. We get L, and we get E, and we get T, and we get E. To cut a longer story short, if we actually look at what we've got, EC appears on the second line that we've got here. We can regenerate the whole of the first two columns by pairing up what we saved, the last column, and the sorted version of that. We can regenerate the whole of the first two columns. And if we sort that again, we can then pair that up with the last column again, and eventually we can build up the whole table. Now, why is that useful for compression? It's actually useful for a whole load of things. Uh, it's used for compression, it's used for string searching, it's used for genomics, all sort of things make use of this transform. But in terms of compression, why is that useful? Well, to do that, we need to go back to a longer example. So we are going to go back uh, to Hamlet's soliloquy, but I'm not going to type it in by hand. I've got it in a file there. I'm going to feed this through um, the program, and I'm going to run it into the BWT program. This time, I'm not going to generate the whole table. I'm only going to generate the last column. And what's interesting, once we've done this, and once we've sorted it, and we take the last column, is that what we end up with is that we have a whole load of runs of characters which are the same. So we've got OOO there, we've got N, 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 N here, we've got N, N, N here a bit later on in there. We've got lots of Ts. So by running it through the Burroughs Wheeler transform, if we take the last column, we not only get something that we can use to regenerate the whole original data, we can run it through that algorithm to decompress it, but we also get something which has lots of characters that are consecutive, which we can run through the run length encoding routine to compress down to a smaller step. Now, the interesting thing is why that actually happens. And we can see that if we actually look at both the beginning and the end of the two columns. And we pick an example. I'm going to look at the lines that begin with the letters HE. So on the left-hand side, the first 10 characters or so are the matrix. And then on the right-hand side, we've got the last few characters of the matrix because this is 525 characters long and my screen's not big enough. Each of these lines at the beginning that begin HE they all end with T. And the reason that is, is because if we think about it, we built up this matrix by rotating the characters to the left one step and then rotating them to the left another step. And that gave us each of the things. So each of the ones where HE begins at the beginning of that, the character that was before it has come over onto the right-hand side. And then when we've got words like the, which begin with a T and then have HE following them, or there, or there with an IR and so on, they'll all end up sorting into the same spot, which is what we've got them here. And of course, because they all had a T that preceded them, that's ended up on the right-hand side. So that right-hand column actually has whole runs of common characters because we're actually not compressing random data. We're compressing data that actually has meaning and has structure. In this case, it's the English language grammar. If it was something else, it would have its own structure with it as well. And so by using this and then coupling it with a few other things, um, where they don't encode the actual ASCII codes, they rearrange the table after each character, we can actually get to a really nice compression algorithm which is used all over the internet, um, bzip2 for compressing files, for distributing things on Unix systems and in other places as well. But it's also a really nice example, as we said at the beginning, of how by changing the model, you'd never want to use the Burroughs-Wheeler transform for storing text. You'd never want to have your Word document or your 
uh, LaTeX document represented in the Burroughs Wheeler transform, it would be a nightmare to edit. Your computer would be slow because you'd have to repurpose it into the reading order to actually access it. But actually to compress it, we get an, a version of the document, a model of the text that is much more um, compressible. And so by changing the model, as well as changing the encoding, we can end up with a really good compression algorithm. I, 2L, one space, one S, one U, one N. It gets massively bigger. This sort of encoding, what's commonly referred to as... Up at the top of the file with pointers to where all these words occurred. And if in doubt, use the pointers for repeats of...